Welcome to Apostolic Life in the 21st Century, a podcast dedicated to helping modern-day believers live out the teachings of the first century church. This podcast is part of the teaching ministry of Dr. David K. Bernard. Dr. Bernard has dedicated his life to studying the Bible and helping believers apply its message to their daily lives. In Apostolic Life in the 21st Century, Dr. Bernard answers your questions about what the Bible teaches and how those teachings apply to everyday life. Thank you for joining us for this episode. Pentecostals are accustomed to seeing converts baptized by full immersion in water. In other words, if you're not familiar with that term, um, we dunk them underwater. So people who visit a a Pentecostal church for the first time, they may be surprised to see that most Pentecostal churches are going to have what we call a baptistry or a baptismal tank. Usually it's a, we might even call a giant pool or uh, our, our bathtub. Or if that's not available, we'll baptize them in a swimming pool, lake, or river, just anywhere where somebody can be completely immersed. Now, people who come in from different faith traditions, different Christian traditions, that might be a real surprise for them because in some churches, the priest or pastor will just sprinkle water on a convert's head, which is sometimes called sprinkling. And in those cases, of course, it only requires a little water. So to, to, the question is, does it really matter if somebody's fully immersed at baptism or or if they're just sprinkled with water? Does, does God honor both methods? What's the right way? I want to make two points. First of all, it's absolutely clear that in the New Testament, people were immersed when they were baptized. In fact, the word baptize is transliterated from the Greek baptizo, which means to dip, to plunge, to immerse. And so when the translators of the King James Version, as well as before the King James Version, when people are translating to English, they face this delicate question. Then the Greek, it means to immerse, but their historic church like the Church of England or the Roman Catholic Church, although they recognized immersion as valid, the vast majority of the practices by that time were sprinkling or pouring. So if they were to translate the word, actually translate the Greek word into the equivalent English meaning, it would call their own church into question. So to finesse the point, they just said, well, let's transliterate. In other words, let's spell the Greek word in English and create an English word baptize so that we can impart whatever um, ecclesiastical meaning that we want to and obscure the meaning. So if they had really translated, it would say, like Acts 2.38, be immersed in the name of Jesus Christ. Then, Then there would be no question. So I will give you some more biblical evidence in just a moment. But my second point is this. Well, does it really make any difference? Why would God care? You know, what's the big deal? And as apostolic believers, one of our fundamental points of hermeneutics or interpretation of Scripture is we accept apostolic authority. In other words, what the apostles of the New Testament, the early church as recorded in the New Testament, what they consistently preached, taught, and practiced, we feel that's authority for us. So we don't have the option. So, for example, when we take communion, uh, we take the fruit of the vine, that is the, the juice from the grape, and we eat the bread. Um, what if somebody says, well, why don't we just have cake and ice cream and punch? And is it going to send me to hell? Well, we don't even answer that question. We don't have theological discussions of if you drink punch for communion, are you going to hell? If you eat cake for communion, are you going to hell? We just say, wait a minute. We're going to do it like Jesus and the apostles did it. We're going to do it like the first century did it because that's our authority. So even if we were to say, does it really matter? That We don't get that far to that question because we're supposed to do it the way the apostles did it. And that, that in itself can be a lengthy discussion, but basically I would just say simply this. Jesus is the one who commissioned the apostles. And so to accept the lordship of Jesus Christ, we accept the teaching and practice of the the apostolic church, the the apostles and their associates of the first century as recorded in the New Testament. That's our authority because that goes back to Jesus. Jesus didn't start any churches in personally. Uh, you know, he didn't start any local congregations. He didn't write any books. But in the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 19 through 20, he commissioned his apostles to go to make disciples of all the nations, to baptize them, and to teach them all of his commandments. So when we follow the apostolic church, 
were following the method that Jesus chose to establish the church. Now, what did the apostolic church do? Well, it's absolutely clear. And what did Jesus do? It's clear. So Matthew chapter 3, when Jesus himself was baptized, uh, the scripture makes clear he didn't need to be baptized for sin because he was without sin, but he was baptized to fulfill all righteousness, to set the example for us. To just, and so he came up out of the water. Clearly, he was immersed. In Acts chapter 8, when Philip baptized the Ethiopian eunuch, they both went down into the water. When John the Baptist baptized, and of course he's the one that baptized Jesus, in John chapter 3, he, he baptized in Enon near Salem because there was much water there. So if he was simply sprinkling or pouring, all he need, would need is a local well, any village, any home. All he had to have is just a little container. But no, he wanted to baptize people where there was a significant pool or river of water. Uh, and then when you look at the symbolism, and this comes, this applies also to the purpose of baptism, and therefore it doesn't really make a difference. In Romans chapter 6 and also Colossians chapter 2, it says that baptism is a burial with Christ. That presupposes full immersion. So imagine Paul writing to the, the church in, in Rome, and the, the issue at hand is, can we continue in sin? He says, absolutely not. Don't you know that you died to sin? When you are baptized, you are buried with Christ. So the old man, the old person, the old life is dead and buried. Well, if baptism was just by sprinkling, imagine the, the, the Roman believers getting that letter and saying, don't you know when you got baptized, you were buried with Christ? No, I didn't know that. What, what are you talking about? It only makes sense if they could think back, oh, yeah, now I get it. That's why the preacher dunked me under the water. I was being buried. And, you know, this became very vivid to me as a pastor when I would baptize people that had no background in church, had no clue. And when, you know, there's a human instinct, instinctive reaction of self-preservation, okay? So when somebody tries to push you under water, you think you're going to drown. And so you fight. So I had to learn to explain to people, especially people that weren't raised in church. Now, I'm getting ready to dunk you underwater. When I do, just relax. I'll have my hand on yours. I'll push you under, but I'll immediately pull you back up. So just don't worry. But when you feel me pushing you, I have to make sure you're completely underwater. So relax. Don't stiffen up. Don't fight me. And they would. And then I begin to realize, you know what? This is an amazing example of what it means to have faith because you are actually trusting the Lord with your life. And, and this, this initiatory act, when you're getting baptized, you're trusting the pastor. You're putting your life, so to speak, in his hands while you're putting your spiritual life in God's hands. So I realize that baptism is more than just a symbol. It is actually part of your burial with Christ, um, washing away of your sins, and putting your faith in Jesus Christ for salvation. Now, obviously, the water doesn't save you. The preacher doesn't save you. It's your faith in Jesus Christ, but your faith in Jesus Christ is expressed by obedience to his command. So I go back to the first point is it's absolutely clear, both the, the very word baptizo in the New Testament and the examples that I gave you, as well as the teaching in the, in the epistles, that yes, in the New Testament, baptism was by always by full immersion. And then second, does it make a difference? Yes, because it's closely connected with the meaning and purpose of baptism itself. Then finally, historical note, well, why would people do it any other way? And the reason was, as people lost the New Testament experience of repentance, water baptism, in Jesus' name, receiving the Holy Ghost, as it became a tradition, as a ritual, uh, just a confession of faith, believing the right doctrine, joining the church. Well, then we switch from believer's baptism, or they switch from believer's baptism to infant baptism. And then also, there was a very strong feeling that baptism is for the remission of sins. And so there became a skewed thought, which the Emperor Constantine was a prime example. He wanted to be a Christian, but he wanted to sin his whole life. And he thought, well, if I get baptized, then... I'm not supposed to sin, and then maybe I won't have forgiveness. And so he waited until he was dying and, and got baptized. So that way, 
all the sins of his life could be covered. Now, obviously, to me, that's not genuine repentance. So therefore, <laughs> baptism as a ceremony wouldn't wash away your sins if you're not repentant. It takes repentance plus baptism. But the point is, they start, and then they also believe that baptism was necessary. So they even came up with this idea, well, babies that die, they're going to go to hell or something bad's going to happen to them. So let's baptize them as soon as we can, which I think that's also unbiblical because it goes back. The Bible talks about believers baptism. You must repent and believe on Jesus. Then you're qualified for baptism before that time. Um, you're not qualified, and if you're a child, of course, I believe, as we discussed, I think, in a different podcast, that a child that's under the true age of repentance and accountability, we believe God's grace has, has a plan for them and covers them. But my point is, as the church lost the biblical understanding of repentance and receiving the Holy Spirit and the plan of salvation and the new birth, they started practicing infant baptism and deathbed baptism. Well, in both cases, immersion was very inconvenient. And so by default, sprinkling or pouring became the standard baptism. So my point is, this practice didn't come from the New Testament. It didn't come from the meaning, purpose, and significance of baptism. It came from non-biblical practices that are actually contrary to the meaning of baptism. So all the more reason why we should reject something that actually represents a false doctrine of baptism and reinstate the true biblical understanding of water baptism. If somebody has been baptized by sprinkling, would you encourage them to uh, be rebaptized? Yes, absolutely. So if they've been baptized by sprinkling, what I would say, and I would use Acts 19, although it's not talking about sprinkling per se, but in Acts 19, you had some disciples of John the Baptist. They were baptized by John, but it was a, a preparation for Christian baptism, but it wasn't actually Christian baptism. So you could say John's baptism was the will of God for that time, but it was temporary. When Paul found these disciples, he baptized them a second time to take on the name of Jesus Christ. So to me, that's an analogy. If you were baptized in some way, but it's not the correct way, at least not for today. Well, you shouldn't be content. You know, there's this thought, well, my heart is right. My intention is right. So the action doesn't matter. But in the Bible, faith is always demonstrated by obedience. It's not what you think, it's how you act. And so I would answer the question then, if you've been sprinkled, well, even though I appreciate the fact you made this positive step toward God instead of uh, you know, ignoring God, that doesn't fulfill the real purpose and it doesn't fulfill the scripture. So now that you have a greater understanding, do not be content with your former action. The way you express your genuine faith and your understanding is to go ahead and fulfill the scriptural example. So absolutely, yes, you should be baptized by immersion and specifically in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for listening to this episode of Apostolic Life in the 21st Century. If you enjoy this podcast, please take a moment to give us a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. We also appreciate it when you share Apostolic Life in the 21st Century with a friend or family member. And make plans to join us again next time as we look at how the Bible applies to everyday life.